Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, warm greetings. I regret that I was not able to join you in person, but I'm delighted to contribute to this important event. I commend the Human Rights Resource Center for convening this meeting and for choosing this critical theme. Let me start with a personal perspective. During the dark days of civil war in my homeland, Sierra Leone, countless women and children were abducted by rebels, raped at gunpoint, brutalized and left for dead. In the aftermath of these atrocities, I traveled from village to village recording testimonies for the special court for Sierra Leone. So I am not speaking about an abstract issue. I have seen firsthand what war does to women and children. In my current role as United Nations Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, I am confronted every day by atrocities that shock the collective conscience. And yet, every day, I am also moved by the dignity and resilience of survivors, the courage of frontline service providers, and the dedication of activists, academics, politicians, and practitioners like all of you who strive for, to better understand the scourge. It has been said that knowledge is power, and I believe that we cannot prevent what we don't adequately understand. A starting point is to understand gender-based discrimination as both a cause and a consequence of conflict-related sexual violence. It is the invisible driver of rape as a tool of war, used to tell women and girls there is no safe place. Evidence shows that the lower women's status in terms of health, wealth, education, and political power the greater the risk of their exposure to violence. Sexual violence in particular casts a long shadow of shame, trauma, and terror. I have met rape survivors who refuse to come forward to receive medical care, including prophylaxis, to protect them against HIV, for fear that they will be stigmatized and cast out of their community. These women are literally dying of shame. Sexual and gender-based violence is one of the most pervasive yet least punished human rights violations. It is still largely cost-free to commit rape under the cover of war. But I am confident that the reign of impunity will end. Successive Security Council resolutions and international treaties have built a robust framework for prevention. And we know that the cost of prevention in human and economic terms, is immeasurably less than that of recovery. Today, over 160 countries have laws to address violence against women and children. But laws must not only be enacted, they must be respected, implemented, and enforced. As experts in human rights, you know that the legal norms can have a powerful restraining influence on behavior. Today, combating sexual violence is not just an aspiration, it's an obligation. Rape, pillage, and plunder has been the ancient trilogy of wartime terror. But there is light on the horizon. Never before have we seen such positive momentum. From the Global Summit to End Sexual Violence in Conflict, held recently in London, to the appointment by the United Kingdom's Prime Minister of his Special Representative on the Preventing Sexual Violence Initiative, to the appointment by the African Union of a Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security, the appointment by NATO of a Special Representative on Women, Peace and Security, and the naming of a Presidential Advisor on conflict-related sexual violence and child recruitment by the government of the DRC. As a step towards completing the global architecture, the appointment of a dedicated ASEAN representative on women, peace, and security 
will be a welcome development to help anchor the issue politically in the region. National ownership, leadership, and responsibility are the essential ingredients of durable peace. Everyone has a role to play in their own spheres of influence to end violence against women. We have a long road to travel, but the survivors are our moral compass, and we must summon the courage that embody to stop rape now.